I um, think of Jim Hansen a lot, and I thought of him a lot as I was doing this preparation, uh, because he, um, you know, he had the cowbell, he got everybody in the meeting rooms and all the rest, and, and uh, he was always a, a real supporter of mine from the very uh, beginning at the University of Minnesota, and so I, I feel that, uh, that legacy um, with him and appreciate the honor. Well, uh, okay, so here's a uh, follow a little bit of my uh, hiero hieroglyphics here, but uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the ways things happened uh, having to do with PigChamp uh, and really how things evolved. Well, uh, first of all, I really got to the University of Minnesota Veterinary School unintentionally in a lot of ways because I basically needed a job after I graduated from vet school. And I had a, I had a job, but I, I was really focused on the cattle industry. I was re very much uh, passionate about beef cattle, both uh, cow-calf and feedlot. And I came to the University of Minnesota to do a dairy herd health internship. It was a pretty innovative internship with John Anderson. You remember uh, that uh, he was kind of a crazy man, but it was very uh, good to have an internship with him. And then Al uh, really recruited me into the, uh, into the swine group, and that was, uh, that was my transition over to the pig side. I, I'm uh, grateful that I worked for three years putting myself through vet school working on the swine barns at the University of Illinois. So I had uh, some practical experience with pigs, and Al recruited me, and uh, then uh, through a whole series of um, events uh, that included um, getting involved with pigs, of course, and then being involved in the swine group with Al and the graduate students that were there at the same time, which was like 1979, 1979, 1980. Uh, well, uh, that uh, really um, propelled the early development of PigChamp, but uh, I, and I say this, I write this in my presentation in, in, the, in the proceedings. Uh, so I said to Al, uh, for various reasons, and I talk about it in the paper, that what I wanted to do for my masters was to design and uh, create a, a record system for sows. Uh, and uh, he said no. He said no. Uh, I, you, we're not going to support that. Uh, we're never going to have computers on swine farms. I'll never forget that conversation. Of course, you know, you know, within a year, Al was like, oh, yeah, computers all the way. I mean, that was Al Lehman right there. It was, uh, well, I got new information. And, uh, so, but he said no, so I did uh, an economic analysis of parvovirus vaccine with Ross Cutler. Uh, but I do have to say that up at the top there in that blue box, Harvey Hilly, uh, and this is a really unknown story, uh, had a couple thousand dollars left in a research budget, and he said, here, I'm going to give you this money, and you uh, go do the software thing that you were talking about. And uh, that allowed me to hire uh, this fellow, Gerard Nimis, who was really a brilliant programmer, although, you know, we didn't, I mean, he just, we, we just uh, found him. Actually, it was Bill Hall that found him, and... Uh, brought him into the fold, uh, and I hired him, and, and essentially the rest was history. That led over four or five years to what then kind of evolved into uh, PigChamp with um, Dr. Roger Morris and Will Marsh. And I do highlight two people here that are also unknown in this story, which is um, Mike Hill and Bill Hall, both veterinarians. They were graduate students at the University of Minnesota at the same time, 1980-ish. And uh, really, without those two lifting me up at a really tough time um, that uh, my father had just passed away when I was right in the middle of this, and they just stepped in and uh, lifted me up and kept things going. Uh, and without them, uh, I don't think that PigChamp ever really would have uh, happened. So I want I want to give a shout out uh, to those two fellows. Uh, just, uh, I don't even know why I put Bob's, uh, he, was, he was just a hanger on in the Pig Champ project. He didn't do anything <laughs> really, um, but I, 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 I did find your picture and I put Trevor's picture, Trevor Ames, um, because um, I wanted, uh, you know, it, it just felt better to have three people with facial hair in this, uh, in this slide, so Trevor's uh, up there, but I really, uh, Trevor and I started as interns at the same time at the University of Minnesota Vet School. And he had the cake job because he was in the clinic, and I had the field service job, which was really a lot tougher. 
and I was working with John Anderson. So, uh, but he, he, uh, he and I became very good, close friends, and, um, and uh, uh, all the way back to the very beginning of July of 1978, when we were here. Well, that development led to over, yeah, short story, led to Pig Champ, and then uh, really interesting for me in terms of how this influenced my development and my thinking. When I left the University of Minnesota, which was in mid-1990, there were about 4,000 uh, customers of PigChamp around the world, which, by the way, was, yeah, I mean, we, that was, again, uh, really completely unintentional. The, what we wanted to do was develop some software that would allow us to collect data and understand sow farms and understand what made, um, what, were, what were some of the differences in high productivity versus low productivity sow farms, and could we analyze that data and understand it. And our goal was to get 40 farms in Minnesota on PigChamp. That was the total, sum total of the goal, and that would drive a couple research projects. And uh, Well, it went a different direction than that. And so there were about 4,000 uh, customers or users of PigChamp by the time I left in the mid-1990s. And then I had this uh, really great experience of uh, being hired uh, by PIC, so I spent 50% of my time as a consultant uh, for PIC, and much of that time was devoted to working in the, uh, with the Pigtails software, primarily in Ames, uh, after they kind of uh, consolidated the offices for that software, and uh, I was doing a lot of benchmarking, digging into the data, uh, and I helped in participate in some of the design efforts having to do with kind of the evolution of where pigtails went. Uh, and that really helped me understand how a different software program was built and worked. And also, uh, two really key pieces. Number one was, uh, if you remember how the old pigtail system worked, they had a bureau in Ames, Iowa. There were about 40 different data entry stations. And producers uh, all around the US would send in little cards that they carried around in their pockets. And those cards would get entered. And it was a central database, and it was uh, continuously updated. You know, these cards would come in each week. So central database, continuously updated, and really just an ongoing uh, database that was uh, able for somebody like me to be queried and, and uh, mined and benchmarked and all the rest. And uh, they... They had, the, they had the model, they had the right model. It was a central database that was kind of real time and uh, a per sow per year fee, which is really the only way this business works, uh, and the ability then to mine this data. Of course, they were, you know, it was mostly PIC genetics, but still it was very, very useful. And, they, and then they, um, in my mind, I, you know, I would say uh, they really made a mistake. They went, uh, the, the direction, of course, everybody was going this direction, and so it's one of those things you only know it in hindsight. They went to then uh, shrink-wrapped software, you know, with Pigtails, Production Manager, and then PigCare, and really got away from the whole central bureau and never got the database back after that happened. And I thought to myself, if I ever get to do this again, I am going to do exactly this model. I am going to work at creating a ongoing, real-time, centralized database that allows for continuous mining and um, analysis. Uh, and so that's what I did when we started MetaFarms. That was the, re that was the number one design goal in um, the development that we did over the last eight years or nine years was based on my experience there. And the other thing was the benchmarking. So, you know, analyzing this data uh, we, uh, monthly, because I wrote the articles for their newsletter uh, that, was, that came out every, uh, at the end of every month about what, was, what were they were learning in this database. And it was almost all, uh, it was 500 some farms, and it was almost all Canberra 15 genetics at the time. And that was a really big aha moment for me, because I was doing the same thing. I was looking to see what Top performance versus bottom performance. Top 25% versus bottom 25%. What were the things that were, we were able to distinguish? And the only, really, the only thing out of many, many factors was outside gestation versus inside gestation. Outside, the odds ratios were so much uh, weighted to poor performance in outside gestation units. I mean, and that's when there were outside gestation units. That, uh, and that was the only thing that really came out of that data. But the biggest thing that I learned was... Uh, 
there was a wide distribution in pigs born live across 500 farms where they were all the same genetics. In other words, there were some farms in that database that averaged about nine born alive, and there were some farms that averaged maybe 13 born alive, and it was the same genetic line. Uh, and I, I, that I carried with me uh, from the time I learned that, which was uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you can get homogenous uh, to the extent of all the same genetics, and you can keep getting more and more homogenous. Uh, and you would still have a wide distribution. Right? So uh, it was a, that was really an eye-opener for me. And kind of made me, um, it's not, I'm not negative on benchmarking. Benchmarking is really important and good. But uh, you will never find what really are the enablers of the drivers of what makes farms good or bad simply by, just, simply by analyzing the data out of the, uh, out of the database. So I went on. And co-founded um, Meta Farms with um, with a fellow here in the Twin Cities, and uh, this was the vision. The idea was okay. After having done a lot of consulting projects in the 90s, the go-go years in the swine industry in the United States, and I worked with a lot of the largest production companies, and it was really clear to me the big thing was it you got to get all of this data into one place, right? So. Let's put it all into one database. And there were emerging technologies like the web and uh, industrial strength databases like SQL Server and Oracle that, was, that made it possible uh, compared to, say, 1980 when we first did uh, the PigChamp program. And I thought, OK, well, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get data electronically or uh, digitally from uh, packers. And we will get it digitally from feed mills. We'll pull that in electronically, build uh, import routines and uh, pull that into that uh, into the database. So we've got sows linked with nursery groups and finishing groups and wean to finish groups and carcass information and sales information and feed information and movement information and inventory information all in the same place. Because uh, there, were, there were these large scale systems uh, that were building out uh, you know, at a rapid rate were really outpacing their infrastructure and there were uh, there, there, were, there was more than one large-scale system that I was on that uh, had um, maybe three or four people doing their only job 40 hours a week every week was inventory reconciliation. So inventory reconciliation between, say, pig champ being used on the sows and spreadsheets being used on tracking some of the nursery groups and finishing groups, and three or four people devoted full-time to just in, uh, reconciling inventories. So uh, that, was the, that was the vision. And uh, if I had known how difficult that was going to be, I may not have actually started this uh, down this path. Because I thought it was going to be uh, not that, you know, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, piece of cake, but I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near as hard as it has been. Uh, now, in order to realize this vision, there's, there's four building blocks. And it really gets kind of straightforward, easier said than done. But the easiest pieces are the, are the records having to do with the animals. So you need a sow record, which is really an individual record. All of you know what goes into sow records or individual animal records. The events, you know, uh, arrivals, uh, breedings, farrowings, weanings, all the rest. Uh, and you need a group record. And the group record is the record of the nursery group, finishing group, wean to finish group. Uh, so those two are the easiest, easiest pieces. Uh, you also need a physical layout. You need to be in the database. You need to, to be able to map a physical structure of a production system. And if, for those of you, and I know Hank Harris wrote a book on this, to try to actually figure out how to describe these production system hierarchies is really a challenge. And so building the database that supports that also is a challenge, but not even as much of a challenge as the key piece to linking all this together, which is these movements. And that has been just a, I, we had to completely redo our first attempt at tracking movements, which I thought was, you know, we had it in PigChamp. And I thought, oh, well, that's good enough. Basically followed that same model. Not a chance, not, not a chance. We, had, we spent two years rewriting a movements functionality uh, because uh, we just, I, I had no clue uh, really what goes on in the trenches. And uh, by the way, that's a, I have to say that that's a black box. Uh, these are the heroes of the pork 
production systems are the people who uh, work the flows. That, you know, it's a black box. Uh, you'll go into farms or uh, offices and you'll see whole walls devoted with post-it notes and all sorts of things about tracking flow and then managing that flow. And, uh, you know, I think of Gene Nome at uh, Western Operations in Ames for Smithfield and Steve Thompson at Tyson. There's a whole series of these people that are in their own world and they are really the core of what makes a pork production system run are these people who are managing the flows. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's completely undocumented. Nobody has ever written about it. Nobody's ever published anything about it. Nobody's ever talked about it. There is nothing that you will find about uh, how this actually works on these farms, on these systems. So, I, okay, that was the vision. I said it was harder than uh, I thought. So, uh, you know, okay, we're going to track this information now. Yes, we're going to track it, and in terms of large-scale systems, the, uh, the tracking is, well, we need to track these attributes. We need to track things like pyramid, uh, pod, flow, but we can't, I mean, it's not just one flow. We actually have lots of multiple independent flows going at the same time. So some sow farms and some nurseries and some finishers need to participate in multiple flows at the same time, but independently. And so, you know, we have a genetic flow that's got two different health statuses, same genetics, two different health statuses, but at the same time, uh, that is aimed at a particular set of customers, and uh, uh, then another flow is same genetics, same health status, different set of customers. So there's, uh, I thought one flow was enough, but one flow is not enough. You need a whole bunch of flows, and they have to be independent of one another. Business unit, who, who owns uh, segments of this production system? feed mills, supervisors, stocking density. Uh, so, okay, I, just, I get this. This is all pretty straightforward because these are independent and uh, attributes, so you can, you don't have to really, they're not rigid, you know. You can assign these and, and it doesn't really screw up your database if you get it wrong. Uh, as opposed to this, which uh, you got to get right, which is the, the hierarchy that's fixed, right? The sow complex, sow unit, and on the finishing side, the producer or the grower, the site, barn, room, uh, row, people track by row in, in uh, sow units, pen, stall, and crate. So that's pretty straightforward. I, I, you know, this we get. Uh, okay, so and if it was just that, uh, I'd be okay. But uh, it's not just that. Okay, so and, uh, well, it turns out that you have to have two dates for every event. So we're talking about weaning events, breeding events, uh, farrowing events, movement events. You have to have two dates. You have to have an event date. That's the date it actually happened. And then you have to have an applied date. That's the date the accountants or the controllers use when they put that information into the accounting system. And those two dates can be and often, in most cases, are different. And so we learn this by uh, having this conversation with a uh, controller or a CFO. Uh, and the conversation was, um, you sell a thousand pigs from a finishing unit, and uh, that empties the finishing unit. So I, in a foolhardy way, thought that when you ran an inventory report, you would want to see that that barn said zero that their pigs are all gone, and there are no pigs in that barn. No, wrong, wrong. No, the, the accountants and the controllers who really do, uh, you know, they're the winners in any of this, uh, said, no, um, we can't, they, they have to stay on the balance sheet and participate in the inventory valuation until we get the check posted back from whoever we sold these pigs to, Packer, primarily. And so let's say you sell on a Thursday and you don't get the check until Tuesday. Well, the pigs are gone from the barn. The inventory truly is zero, but it can't be reflected in your system. Your information system has to still say that there's a thousand pigs in that barn. But the production people, they want to run a report that shows that the building has zero pigs in it. So it's like, oh, you got to you be kidding me. All right, so we'll rewrite the movement piece for that. Well, then 
um, gee, uh, you need two calendars. You've got to have a production calendar for the production people, certain start dates to the week, a uh, certain way of looking at those weeks. Uh, and those production count weeks need to be on all the reports, like action lists or um, inventory flows on the finishing side and all the rest. And uh, But uh, it also have to be, it has to be able to track fiscal year. And the accountants need to be able to run it in a way that the production people don't. So they have to run it like the accountants like to run it. OK, all right, fine, great. Uh, rewrite, invest more money, rewrite. Um, and uh, now uh, you have to actually uh, build in subgroup tracking. So uh, really what we want to do is we want to track the inventory of the pigs um, separately from the feed. In other words, you know, a lot of people you say, well, you got a group of pigs in, you do a closeout at the feed level, wherever the feed bin, that's your closeout. So you'd say, you know, 1,000 head barn uh, with feed bin, one group, that's a closeout. Uh, well, I wish it was just that easy. Subgroups, we have to be able to track inventory at a room level, but feed at a barn level. And then we have to roll that up to be able to do a closeout. It's like, at this point, it's like, come on, you guys. I mean, how many times do we have to learn more and rewrite in order to make this happen? Uh, and I just described, really, five to six years' worth of work in this, uh, in this slide right here. So uh, the challenge, and um, I, I really appreciate Tim and Paul doing the presentation this morning. They, uh, I was down at the uh, Swine Vet uh, Center Clinic a week ago last Friday to uh, do, do my presentation to them and, and to the whole group of the of vets down there and get feedback and you know, help me kind of get oriented. And um, you know, it, it's always great. You go down there and you just get blasted. You know, it's like, uh, no, 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 go in the wrong direction. No, 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 that's a, oh, man, got a long way to go on this, on this presentation. So uh, I, and I was really struggling with what is the narrative path that I want to take in this presentation. No, no doubt about it. Um, but something that Paul said right at the end of that meeting was, you know, now we've got all of this data uh, and, it's, and it's easy to access, but you know, how do we get our arms around it? How do, we, how do we really understand that? And this came up again yesterday, and Bob and I, uh, Bob Morrison and I were talking about how do you teach, how do you teach this approach? Now, with um, PigChamp, uh, with PigChamp it was pretty straightforward because it was only the sows, it was really limited, it was really constrained, and it was really pretty straightforward. You take a performance monitor, that's your highest level, that's your monitoring report, and you're paying attention to what's going on. And then if there's issues or, or problems there against you know, targets, low farrowing rate, low litter size, whatever it might be, you can dive into some diagnostic reports. So you split it up by parity and on and on. It was the, the framework, and that's really the key, the framework was really straightforward and easily teachable. In contrast, then, when you add in all the rest of this data, uh, it is really a challenge. And so I'm just going to uh, that I'm going to focus now for a few minutes on how to um, apply what we know on the sows in terms of our framework uh, against what we now are building in terms of the data that, that is a you know entire system an entire system's worth of data. So in terms of working with sows, well, basically there, uh, or any of this information, there's four things, right? Four buckets. You're either uh, you're doing one of these at any time. One is operations management. So on a sow farm, that's action lists, all the the uh, the kind of tools that uh, the barn people use to know um, you know where the pigs, where the sows are, where the gilts are, when to move, you know what's the snake look like, where are the open pens or, or crates and all the rest of that. That's day-to-day -day operations. Uh, same thing is true on the nursery and finishing side of things. You've got a lot of operations, way more than on the um, sow side. So that's operations. That's day-to-day. -day. That's really making this business run. Uh, and then you've got monitoring, okay? So you're looking at data flowing over time. That's the performance monitor approach. And you're really looking at that. That's really what, ha what has happened, right? But you're looking at that, and you're looking at the last 10 weeks, last year, last two years, trends, understand where the system is. So that's trend analysis, 
And then you can also do your ranking, sow farm ranking or ranking on growers by daily gain or feed conversion. Those are monitoring types of activities. Projections, looking forward, uh, not a lot done there, but think about the uh, farrowing rate report. That's a projections report, really. Okay, So I'm going to get into that in just a second. And then <laughs> what, um, I, you know, I really, the hair on the back of my neck stood up when I heard this. I was with a large-scale production system. I was with the controller, and we were looking at reports and ways to pull data out of reports. And uh, it, essentially, he was, you know, he was really dismissive uh, about uh, the data. He said, oh, that's project work. That's just project work. You know, that's, it's not making this system run. We need to know, you know, what trucks to book and where to take these pigs and what space is empty and all the rest of that. You uh, want to analyze the data and look, uh, you know, at, what, at wean age effects on, what does wean age uh, impact profitability, which is a really important analysis. But a lot of these guys at the accountant controller CFO level, you know, that's project work. But I thought, oh, okay, well, that's analysis. It's a lot of what we do as veterinarians. It's a lot of analysis work to, and it powers huge decisions. I mean, multi-million dollar decisions come out of that kind of work. Due diligence on changing genetics, uh, changing uh, flow because you're increasing wean age and all the rest. So I'm not deriding it by any means. It's really important. But it does occur outside of the normal time pressures of a production system. And for the people that are in the trenches and for the money people in the system, this is something that it's like, yeah, we need some, re we need some way to get at that data. But don't, you know, I mean, don't bug me with that. That's not, not relevant to me. Until you come and try to say we're changing genetic lines. And then we better have a, that well, well thought out. And so there's two go-to reports on the south side for managing sow units. One is the performance monitor, as I've said. That answers the question, what's happened, trends. And the other one is the farrowing rate report or the farrowing chart. And um, in our uh, uh, reincarnation of the farrowing chart, I just took the farrowing rate report from PigChamp and the farrowing control chart from Pigtails and put them together, used the best of both of those, and created a kind of a visual uh, approach to it, much like the Pigtails one, for those of you who remember that or use it. And the farrowing rate really is, uh, the farrowing rate report is a projections report. It tells you what is going to happen. Okay, so to, uh, to drill into this a little bit more, and I know that everybody in here has looked at this over and over again, and so um, I just want to make sure that, every, that everybody's on the same page because uh, it's going to relate to where I take this. So in a farrowing rate, report for a single farm, you've got the, the diagonal, right? So the diagonal means that at that top line, 17 weeks or 20 weeks for the, if you've got some closed breeding groups, the top line is the ones that have, are farrowing this week, let's say, okay? if that's week 17. So those are the ones that are farrowing this week, and then each line below that is one week step back. So those are the breed groups going down that left-hand side, you got the breed, and I, you know, I know that everybody knows this, right? But uh, I wanted to do something with this way of looking at this information, which was um, a real challenge, and I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, so you got this breed week, and so here's, this is the same week as what's up here. And for those of you who are as old as I am, you remember the... Uh, what used to hang on the wall in a lot of sow farms that PIC put together. I can't remember what it was called. One was called pig log or something, but it was basically it was a visual representation in, uh, you know, physical representation of this report. And so each one of these boxes essentially tells you the number of sows that are pregnant at that, at that uh, gestation week. So this is week 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. And so you've got a projection. If you uh, have some uh, information on the probability of farrowing at a particular gestation week, which, by the way, it, you will not find published data on that. Really important in terms of running projection models. What is the probability of farrowing if the breed group is at week eight of gestation? Well, it actually turns out to be pretty high in most cases, but those probabilities of farrowing, given what week of gestation you're at, 
are the key numbers that influence the projections models. And what we did was we just implemented six tracking categories. So you, what you want to do is look at a box and see the fallouts. You know, did they fall out because they repeat, preg check negative, abort, and on, on and on. Okay, so that's the farrowing chart for a single sow farm. Now, you know, what you can do is you can then consolidate that. You can roll it up. And you can roll it up uh, so that you're looking at breed group flow across sow farms for a production system. And so here now, you're looking across, same thing, gestation week, but now you've got this, these are all the sow farms that have breed groups in this, in this week. So these are this third week of gestation, and obviously the rest of the report would go way up there. But I'm looking at the most, the recent three weeks of breeds rolled up across sow farms. Right? And so that's the beauty of an integrated database. Right? Rather than having these individual data files, like PigChamp, DAT files for each one of the sow farms, very tough to do this unless you do it by hand. But if you put them into a central or integrated database, then you just push a button and you get the integrated roll-up. So we know some things about these pigs, the pigs that are in the uterus of the sows that are in week three. We know something about those pigs already. Right? We know what pyramid they're in, what pod they're in, what flow they're in. Are they destined for a customer? We may know that by the way they allocate a flow or some attribute of some grouping attribute. We know what genetic line is, uh, it is, and uh, in many cases we know what the health status is. And I'm, uh, I got some fame for coming up with the phrase um, health trumps genetics. And so in any case out there, health always wins. Health trumps genetics. You know, you never get to, uh, genetics obviously will never be fully expressed in the face of health challenges, but people seem to like that phrase. And so uh, you do have uh, the ability to look, you have, if people are tracking it, you can even see the health status of the pigs in the uterus, and you can even estimate what that pig flow might be uh, at week three of gestation, given that you know the probability of farrowing. And we also know something about these breed groups. We know that they're cohorts, and we know the number pregnant at any point in time, uh, how many repeats and aborts and what the conception rate is. Again, really important information for managing forward rather than backwards, okay? Uh, took that same thinking and uh, created a report called, uh, that we call the weaned sow cohort report. And this one is same idea. Here, these are the wean weeks, right? Same idea as the farrowing chart, but these are the sows that are weaned. So that's a weaned cohort. And here we're just following those across by week after weaning. And we're looking at categories, what number were served, what, uh, how many were called, how many died, and how many were removed. And so essentially this is a visual representation. And so here for these wean cohorts, there's some activity at 10 to 11 weeks after weaning. There's, uh, here there were two called, here was one called, here was a call, here was a breed at, in the 10th week after weaning. And so these cohorts form at weaning and you can follow them forward and see how they eventually disband. Hopefully they do after some period of time. I gave up after week 17, figuring hopefully there aren't very many weaned sows that are still open 17 weeks out there. But obviously there are in some cases. But you know, most of the action is here. But really, the important thing is that this is looking forward to see what happens with these weaned sows. And it ties into things like matrix and programs for managing parity one sows versus older parity sows. The interesting thing is, and I, I uh, quizzed people on this yesterday uh, in the uh, training session, uh, you're all familiar with a number that's on the PigChamp performance monitor and on many other reports called the percentage of sows, uh, percentage of wean sows bred less than seven days. The percentage of wean sows bred less than seven days, or the percentage bred less than seven days post wean. Well, uh, that and everybody knows what their benchmarks are. 85% is good, and, and better is still even a little higher than that. 60% is bad, and means there's something going on with the biology of the wean sow post weaning. Could be, you know, feed intake and lactation, whatever it might be. Uh, however, um, the number that number really, uh, and I probably came up with the original calculation, or the team did uh, back in 1980 or 81. Uh, that number is meaningless, uh, really, on the performance monitor in PigChamp. And the reason is, 
is the way that number is calculated, it's, uh, you, it takes the number of weaned sows that were bred in a week. So let's say there, let's say there were 100 weaned, the breed target's 150, there were 150 breedings, 100 of those were weaned sows. Well, that calculation takes those 100 weaned sows and it says, okay, of these 100, what percent are less than seven days from weaning? And 85%, so 85 out of that 100 are bred less than seven days from weaning, uh, and then the other ones are the ones that kind of hung out there. Uh, the thing is that that doesn't really tell you what the actual probability is of being bred within a week after weaning. What you have to have there is you have to have a cohort. You have to look forward to understand what percentage are going to be bred, and it's not the same. In fact, it's less. It's going to be in the 65 to 75 percent. Uh, in fact, it gets even more interesting because some of the sows you wean this week are bred this week and contribute to this week's breeding group, and some of the sows you wean this week uh, are bred in the next week and contribute to that breeding group, and it actually splits out to be about 20% wean this week, bred this week, and 40%, uh, 45% wean this week, bred next week. And so if you're a breeding herd manager, you have to know those numbers because that's what you use to figure out how to get our breeding targets met. And the only way you do that is by looking forward rather than looking backwards. Uh, and so there are other cohorts that occur throughout the life cycle of uh, a production uh, of a sow farm. Right? So there's cohorts happening all the time. There's guilt entry cohorts that can be tracked in much the same way as these wean sow cohorts. Uh, there's lifetime cohorts based on arrival age or time. Uh, there's farrowing cohorts, all the sows that farrow in a week. Uh, there's breed group cohorts, that's, uh, that's what the farrowing chart report really is. There's piglet birth cohorts, so you can track piglet births until they disband, that cohort goes away. And there's open sow cohorts, so every week you're identifying a group of sows, not the repeats because they're bred and they go into a, you know, a breed group cohort, but you're finding sows that are open and they become an open sow cohort. And you know maybe there's 10 this week. Well, uh, very interesting to watch that because those groups, those cohorts do not disband very quickly. You'll see those hanging out for a long time uh, in these, uh, when you do a report like this. Okay, so I said these two go-to reports on the performance monitor trends, one of the things that uh, people are uh, doing a lot is uh, not so much statistical process control. I'm not, I mean, that's it's great stuff. Doesn't really play very well uh, at the barn level. So people have moved to target graphs, really thinking about what is our expected performance and how do we, how do we um, teach people in the barns how to drive the sow farm between the two uh, white lines, basically how to keep it on the road. And so the concept of target graphs. And so you basically create a graph and it's got your intuitive boundaries on it, uh, the expected performance. And uh, you print that uh, out and you watch that graph. You print it for a year, mostly it's gonna be blank if you print it in January. You watch it for a year and every dot that comes on each week fills in and you put that up on the wall of the barn and people see, are we driving the south farm the way we want it to be? So target graphs are a big deal. Again, that's trends and it's really looking back at what's happened rather than looking forward. So now, okay, now we got the sow. Let's try to apply that same thinking to the finishing side of things. And this is, this is where, uh, boy, I, I mean, I've, I really have struggled with this. Uh, and I think everybody, all production systems struggle with this as well. And this really gets at the heart of how do we get our arms around this data? Where do we start? What's the opening? Where, what is the entry point? So in the sows, it's really easy. The entry point is the performance monitor or the farrowing rate report. What's the entry point on the, the rest of it, on the rest of the system? Well, okay, uh, first attempt was um, uh, an inventory flow by um, week on feed. And so, you know, basically these are the finishing groups that were placed, uh, that'd be this week, right? So this is one week on feed, which translates into a calendar week. Uh, if that was this week, it would be you know September 21st or September 20th, depending on the production start day of the week. But these are the four or five uh, groups that were placed, and you know something about those, where they were placed, what location they went into, what site, what barn, maybe what room. 
And so uh, you can track that, and that goes then down, and so that would you know keep going all the way down here, would give you a finishing flow, uh, and and you'd see then at the roll-up level going across the top how many pigs we have in week two on feed, week three on week feed, week four on feed. Oh yeah, okay. Well, that's great. It's it's interesting uh, until you get somebody that calls and says, well, we place uh, different ages of pigs into the same group. Uh, and so really, week on feed doesn't work for us. We need age on feed, and then it has to be split out by the proportion of the pigs in the group that are, well, the worst case was, this company's not in business anymore, but I'm not gonna name names. They were placing, um, uh, oh, what was it, going into finishers. They had some five-week-old pigs and some 12-week-old pigs going into the same finishing group. I'm like, what? Uh, you know, I mean, that's really not cool. I mean, that's not, not really what you want to be doing. Well, yeah, but that's the way we flow our system. And we really need to split out those four-week-old or five-week-old pigs from the 12-week-old pigs because week on feed doesn't really tell us all that much. We, you know, we're not going to be able to really tell when we should sell these pigs based on this flow report. All right, back to the drawing board. More investment in software development. Uh, but here's really what... Um, I came to, and you know, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe everybody else has already gotten here, uh, and I'm just being really basic about this, or maybe I just haven't seen it. But you know, I, I've been around a lot of production systems for a lot of years, looking at numbers and reports, and I've never really seen anything like this. And I had this uh, thought as a result of having to prepare this presentation. Right? And in fact, you know, um, I'd really like to stand up here and say, I titled the speech, you know, Production Data, Back to the Future. Uh, and I would really like to be able to stand up here and say, I did that because I thought, I, I came up with this, and I thought, oh, what a great title for the speech. But actually, uh, I didn't. <laughs> I just came up with the title six months ago, and uh, really recently, like, I mean, measured in hours, I, I, I came up with this. <laughs> so, because here's what I wanted. I wanted, I, I said to myself, I want a farrowing rate report for a finishing system. I want a farrowing rate report for the entire finishing system, which means nursery, wean to finish, and finishing groups. I just want it to look that way because I get it. I get what that is. And um, you know what? That was really hard. <laughs> that was really hard to figure out how to make a report look like the um, farrowing rate report. Because uh, let me just take you. This I did really early. I mean, it was like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. I get this. But you know, nobody, none of the production people really like this way of looking at things. So you've got this big flow, it's going downhill, you know, diagonally and to the right, and it just wasn't something that they really uh, w were able to kind of engage with. So uh, I said, well, uh, all right, well, how do I get the report? How do I get a farrowing rate report? Because that's my entry point. If I have this way of looking at a finishing system, uh, and you know what? And actually, you can even extend it back because there's no reason you can't put the breed groups down here too, right? So you can extend this all the way back, and if I wanted to, you know, you could extend it to the GDU level, uh, or even to the closed herd multiplication system, if you wanted to take it even further. And each one of these is just a step back by a week. Well, the, the big thing that I came up with, and like I said, maybe I'm way behind this, and I'd really appreciate any feedback, because uh, I'd like to know whether I'm embarrassing myself, but because everybody, everybody knows this already, but it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, well, really what I want is, uh, I, this is my group, this, these are the pigs that are about, I mean, that are ready, the last ones that are ready to go from a location before that location uh, closes, cleans up, and more pigs go in. So these weeks going across the top here really represent space, not um, uh, the, not a, uh, you know, it's not an 18-week flow because the pigs are going to be, uh, because it's a finishing flow and they're going to be 
sold in 18 weeks, and it's not a model. It, all it is is just go through the database and tell me where these pigs are. Give me the physical location, what barn, room, pen, site. I mean, not pen unless it's a research barn, but site, grower, you know, business unit, uh, flow, on and on and on. You just go through the database and plot those out. Just tell me where they're at and do it so I get a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step -by -step week of what the flow is. Because once you have this, you know, you can do a lot of things with this. You can really create a lot of projections. Really, the projections become very easy because you can imagine, you know, you just put your growth curve in here and the probabilities of mortality and uh, and of course, you know, you're going to have a lot of activity right out here because these are the pigs with that you're making marketing decisions on. These are the groups that you're going to be making paleo decisions on. Uh, you're going to have not so much activity here, but uh, you will have a lot of activity here because you're placing pigs uh, moving from uh, nursery to finishing, or a lot of activity out here where you're moving from either uh, farrowing into the nurseries. And so there's a lot of activity at this point. Uh, and so you can really see kind of by activity where the, you know, where the peaks are. Uh, and then these would be the breed groups, right? And then you can estimate the number of pigs and use your probabilities to figure out what the flow is going to look like. So this one I get really easily, uh, but it really took me a long time to get here. And the key was I, I got to go backwards into the future. I, I got to go uh, 52 weeks back is a pretty typical flow if you include nursery finishing, wean to finish, lactation, and gestation. That's, it's about a 52 week flow. It doesn't really matter. I don't care what it is really. Um, it could be 50 weeks, could be 52, could be 58. If you extend it back to the GDU, it'll go further than that. You know, go all the way as far back as you want to go. It doesn't make any difference. The key was this, this is 52 weeks into the future, even though it starts at the beginning of the report, right? So, okay, you can query. What does this group of pigs, what, what is this? What does this represent? This is real data from a real production system. This is, represents 2,058 pigs that are there in minus one week, which means basically we think that this is going to close. The space is going to become available next week. And this truly is the inventory out there. Uh, so 2,058 pigs, and that's really three, um, barn, or three, three locations, three groups. And uh, again, thinking of these boxes, you've got uh, pigs in, the um, sales, deaths, and that's your inventory, your current inventory. So I've got my current inventory for that box of pigs there. Um, and then I know something about those pigs, so I know who the producer is, what site they're in, what barn, what type, what group, when they started, how many dead, what the mortality is to date. Uh, how many started, how many weeks they have to go, and that would be to the space closing, space closing, not just first sale. First, you know, you can actually figure out what your sales spread would be as well, and that's going to be different than how many weeks to go. Weeks to go is when the space is available again. Uh, and what, how many weeks on feed they are, with 26 weeks on feed. Okay. So um, that's, that really is, for me, a breakthrough. And then uh, this is just a snapshot of a report that um, we've got called Inventory Flow by Production Week. Uh, and what I had to do is I just had to, I had to reformat the, the original report we did into this, uh, into this format. Right? So uh, this, is, uh, the, this is real data from a real production system. And so these are the pigs that are going to be, this is the space will close in week, uh, in, uh, week of October 10th. Uh, now, it doesn't have to close. I mean, they may stay, and probably we have to extend this and say, well, there's zero, and there's plus one, and plus two, and plus three, depending on what your targets are. But uh, you've got, then you've got this next set of pigs here and where they're located, and they're going to be, that space is going to be coming available ending, week ending, well, the week after this, but they're going to all be gone on, by the 17th of October. And then uh, here's the, you know, the next group out there. Got a little bit of a hole there, nothing in that week, but they probably doubled up, you know, in terms maybe early, I don't know what they did there, you know, uh, increased, moved pigs out early uh, from some location. Uh, now, you can also then go ahead and look at these groups with more information. Uh, and so that is 
we got the snapshot of the flow and the system. And that's where I, now, that's, that's my entry point. That's where I would start. That's where I would start with teaching people. With, uh, uh, that is my entry point into the, into the entire production system, because I rolled it into the south farms as well by looking, adding the breeding groups in there, right? So now I want to look through and I want to see uh, what are these groups doing out there. I want to know more information about these groups, right? And spo especially as veterinarians, I'd like to know things about um, what is the uh, current uh, mortality, right? And so you can pretty quickly uh, estimate what the, maybe the closing mortality might be uh, based on the week on feed or how many days on feed they've been. Uh, and then I want to know something about the rate of uh, increase in mortality. And so one way that um, people are doing that is by looking at the percentage of dead within the last seven days. And so that's really a, that tries to get at the rate of the mortality, you know. So, I mean, 8.1% and using conditional formatting in Excel, you can see that that's highlighted. Okay, that tells me something, but it doesn't tell me anything really about the rate at which this mortality, is it going up? Is the rate increasing or the rate going down? And, you know, my PhD was a minor in epidemiology, and so uh, I understand rate calculations. However, uh, the barn guys and the production managers don't understand rate calculations and what a rate um, means. And so uh, this is good enough. Uh, that's, that's, that really is a nice estimate of the rate. Uh, there's also, a, there's lots more information that you know about these sets of pigs out there in the system, things like what was the start weight of that group, what's their feed med, you know, running total on the feed med, on the vet med side, you know, have they made any market sales, what percentage of pigs have gone out as substandards, what's the average market weight running, and then, and you can do all sorts of things with this, and we talked about this yesterday in our trading session, and Matt Ackerman was showing some of the things that he's doing by looking at standard deviations on first loads out, second loads out, third loads out, aiming at setting coefficient of variation targets by load. Okay, also cumulative cost per pig, and um, that's really depending on what they put in for their cost. Like this, I think, is just feed in this situation. Um, and then, based on their cumulative feed intake, uh, you can uh, refer that to a growth curve and get an estimated weight, and it, you can even put in a coefficient of variation or standard deviation and get an estimated variation, which goes back to the model that Paul was showing, which is how do you, how do you work these groups against a grid and optimize both the loads out and then the carcass weight. So you can do all of that uh, given that you're tracking this information across these groups. And as veterinarians, you know, we like to see, uh, understand what's happening with mortalities. And so tracking mortalities in real time and looking at the pattern of mortality by week on feed and a finishing system, and, you know, where is it occurring and how does that differ from flow to flow, health status to health status, and how do we use that to project pig flow? Uh, of course, you've got your closeout reports, and so those become archived and are used like a performance monitor in SOWS to look at what has happened, right? To look at your trends. And one of the things that we've built, but uh, haven't even begun to tap the analysis of, uh, and I'm sure you can't see it, but I'll just circle this, space utilization, pounds per square foot, pounds per square foot per year, pounds per pig, pig space per year. So I think that's, uh, uh, that, that's we're going to uh, have some very interesting data to finally mine and understand space allocation um, uh, analysis, really. And so really what you want to do is push a button and get uh, your closeouts looking just like sow. So this could be looking at uh, pigs born live over a year period of time, week by week by week, but it's not. In this case, it's feed conversion in finishing closeouts, and here's the mortality and feed intake and daily gain. And so really, you got to know your trends in order to understand the context of the performance in the production system. Most systems, unless you've got big externalities, uh, will operate at a pretty narrow range in these performance bands. Well, then, um, you know, as you can see in this line right here, <laughs> I just was illustrating, these are loads coming back from packers. And so you can get the same thing, really the same thought process, uh, 
of a performance monitor thinking, but using data coming back from a packer on the carcass side of things. And uh, Paul showed you the same report, looking at these distributions, load by load by load, lights, heavies in the box. Uh, here's a creative way of uh, looking at this. I think Steve Dreitz was the one who showed me this, that um, you can send a report card out back to the barn and essentially say, in the load you sent two days ago, this was the distribution. Uh, here's how it lays out against a grid, and the reds are bad, the greens are good, and there was an opportunity cost based on the fact that you had more light pigs than you would want, uh, and so that was the, that you can calculate an opportunity cost, and that's good training, um, training education system back to the, back to the barns. Um, one uh, other way of looking at this sales data is something that Hanover does, and they actually, um, Jim Moody presented this at one of the ASV seminars a couple of years ago, and then Tara Donovan uh, also wrote a paper about this, but this is the way they look at it. Uh, same concept as kind of the full value pig, uh, which is the top hog index. And so what they're doing is they're saying, you got these pigs um, that we sold, and now we know uh, based on what the destination the packer told us, we know that some of them died and some of them died at the plant. Some were subjects, some were slows, some were lights, off-grade top hogs. And they, these are just the relative values. So the top hog gets a one, and the rest of these pigs get some uh, percentage of that top hog value. So the off-grade sales are 40% of the top. Well, the, the, the cool thing is that um, you calculate, based on the number of pigs, you calculate what the weighted average is, and they've got a target of 93% as a weighted average of this group. So that's the relative value of the top hog, hog index. And they actually turned it into a, um, a number that you could uh, work with, which is for every 1% uh, increase on a $45 live market, that was, that's worth a dollar per pig sold to the entire production system. In, and that is in cash. So that's the revenue side of things. Well, I think um, uh, I'm going to stop um, at this point. And um, uh, I, I, I'm going to end by letting you know, to really kind of follow on what Tim and Paul were saying, that uh, now these, this is, these are what lenders are saying as of the middle of July of this year. So July, mid-July 2009. This is what lenders are saying to, let's say, a group of 500 pork producers at a meeting in the Midwest. Uh, they're saying, um, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to see the production data. I don't care about the production data. Good production is a given. It's not about production anymore. You know, get that through your heads. I'll give you um, one guess as to who actually uttered those words. Get that through your heads. So somebody from uh, in the uh, uh, lending world in, from Minnesota. Okay? So get that through your heads. The industry doesn't need any more productivity. This is, so this is what the lenders say. Now, of course, you know, three years ago, the pendulum was the other side, right? They're like hammering everybody on, I, you know, what is the story with these mortalities and what is the story with this, you know, uh, conversion and gain? And, you know, you've got to push productivity. And I will guarantee you that they will be back there at some point in the future. But right now they're not because they're all, they're all um, worried about their jobs because they're looking at their hog loan portfolios crumble uh, from a quality perspective underneath them, and you know those internal credit committees and even the auditors are not really all that happy about that, so then they say wow well what here 's what we 've got to do now now you we need break evens and cash flow projections updated monthly, and we want it by group, so we want to see it for all your finishing groups and you need to finish groups, we want it by flow, we want it by business unit, and we want it rolled up to the total system, and we want to see that monthly, and we want to see it within a week after the end of the month. Uh, and so the most important thing, I, well, Tim, uh, Tim and Paul said a lot of important things, but for me, the most important thing was the people who are um, financially um, as sound as they can be are the ones who are good hedgers. And really, that's what this is all about. They're looking, what the lenders are looking at is cash burn and how do you manage risk and what are your stops on the cash burn. In order to do that, of course, this is, they're saying, man, you guys got to upgrade your information systems. We got to get this data out, and we got to have it by flow, and we got to see margins by flow and margins by 
pod, and we've got to see margins by this and margins by that. Um, and uh, really, the, uh, the point is that when you go back to the way I did the farrowing rate report for the finishing system, uh, that's the, that is what will uh, get you to this information that these lenders um, want. So anyway, I hope, that was, uh, I hope that was interesting, and I really do want feedback on that this approach because you know maybe all of you or many of you have seen that before or are doing it and uh, I want to know that um, but I um, I'm really excited about that because I think it's a breakthrough in my way of thinking about how to look at these systems. Mm -hmm.